Okay, so what I have sitting here, as you can see, hopefully my drawing is good enough. So you can see that is a sphere. We're talking about a sphere. Obviously, there is no base on this because there is no flat side at all. It's all one huge surface. So here are our practices of using the area of the base times the height for volume and lateral area and area of basis for surface area. It just doesn't work. So we're going to have to have separate formulas. To derive the formulas for a sphere requires some pretty in-depth calculus. And we don't have that kind of time to get there. And you don't want me to do that anyway. So this is one of the few times I will actually give you a formula and say, you're just going to have to trust me on this. And I'm going to give you two of them. For the volume of a sphere. The volume is equal to 4 thirds, or 4 divided by 3, times pi, times the radius cubed. The only measurable dimensions on a sphere are the diameter and the radius. The radius is really what defines the sphere because it has a center somewhere and every point of the sphere is that same distance from that, that one center point. So let's say that this radius here is 6 inches. So our volume will be 4 thirds times pi times 6 cubed. Now to punch that in the calculator, simpler than it looks, you don't even have to use your fraction key. Just do 4 divided by 3 times, for pi I'm going to put in 3.14 because that's usually what my math lab asks for, times 6 to the power of 3. 904.32. That was measured in inches, so this is going to be in inches cubed. So that is the formula for volume. For surface area. surface area of a sphere is 4 times pi times the radius squared. So for this sphere, our surface area is 4 times pi times 6 squared, which would be 452.16, I believe. Does that look right? So again, that would be 4 times 3.14 times 6 squared, 452.16. Any questions on that? So this allows us to do some fun things like <laughs> this. Yes, we're talking about my definition of fun again. So this is a tank, flat on bottom, a half sphere on top. The diameter of four feet, a total height of 12 feet. I'm only going to ask for, ah, we'll do volume and surface area, why not? For volume, we will start out with the cylinder. 
The volume of the cylinder is the area of the base, which is pi times what? Radius squared, right? So that'd be two feet is the radius. So pi times two squared. It's gonna be 12.6 or 12.56 feet squared. Volume then, we need that area of the base, 12.56 feet squared times, you know the height, what's the height? No, 12 goes all the way up to the top of the half sphere, what's it going to be just up to here? Well, if this is a radius of 2, right, the sphere also has a radius of 2 feet which means this would be 2 feet. So this has to be 10 feet. Does that make sense? So that's 12.56 square feet times a height of 10 feet, or 125.6 cubic feet. So that is for the cylinder portion. For the half sphere, the volume is 4 thirds times pi times 2 to the third power, right? Radius cubed. Then we're going to divide it by 2 because it's only a half sphere. So 4 divided by 3 times, we're going to use 3.14 for pi times 2 cubed. Divided by 2, to cut it in half, 16.75 cubic feet is the volume of that half a sphere. Did everybody catch the keystrokes for that? 4 divided by 3 times pi times 2 cubed and then divided by 2. So total volume... I add those together, I get 142.35 cubic feet. Any questions? Because it's four feet all the way across here, that's two. So then the two of the circle goes up to the top. Surface area, even though that's a full cylinder, there's only one base. Because the top base is covered up by that half sphere, isn't it? So it's not on the surface, it's covered up. So I've only got the one area of the base. I do still need the lateral area for the sphere, which is going to require me to get the perimeter of the base, which is pi times radius, or pi times diameter, I should say. So pi times 4 is 12.56 feet. So the lateral area, 12.56 feet times my height of 10 feet. Do I have to divide that by two? No, this is back to a sphere. This is a rectangular shape, not a triangular. So 125.6 square feet. So that goes up there for lateral area. And then we have to add to that the half sphere. The half sphere is going to be 4 times pi times the radius, which is 2 again, squared, and then divided by 2, which is 25.12 square feet, correct? So 
It's going to go up here. So that adds up to 8, 12, 13, 163.28 square feet for a surface area. Not as bad as you thought it was going to be, huh? So any questions? We've briefly mentioned this next part before, but I want to go over it again just to make sure we've got it down. If this is two feet by five feet. That area is two feet times five feet or 10 square feet. But if I wanted to know that area in square inches, how many of you would say that's 120 square inches? Good. Because it's not. If I have 10 square feet, and I'm trying to convert it into square inches. Who can tell me how many square inches are in one square foot? There we go. 12 by 12 or 144. 12 inches in a foot. A square foot is 1 by 1 or 12 by 12. So 144. Square feet cancel out. 10 times 144 is 1,440 square inches. I can double check that, by the way, if I wanted to. That was the reason I drew out the diagram. 2 feet is 24 inches. 5 feet is 60 inches. If I multiply that out, 24 inches times 60 inches is 1,440. Without drawing the pictures, for volumes, let's say that we have three hundred twenty-four cubic feet, and I want to convert it into cubic yards. Put 324 over 1. Cubic feet on bottom, cubic yards on top. Now the yards are bigger, so it's one cubic yard. Can anybody tell me how many cubic feet are in a cubic yard? Three feet in a yard, but cubic is... 3 by 3 by 3. If it was square feet and square yards, it would be 9 square feet in a square yard. 3 by 3. But if it's cubic, 3 by 3 by 3 is, there you go, 27. So the feet cancel out. Since the 27 is on bottom, we're dividing by it. 324 times 1 is 324 cubic yards. 1 times 27 is 27. 324 divided by 27 is 12. Cubic yards. So keep that in mind now in this next step. If I have a triangle, or any shape really, I can enlarge it or reduce it or whatever, and I can find its new size. Let's say that this is 8, 14, and 18 inches here. 
And I have to tell you that this angle matches up with that angle, and this angle matches up with that angle. I have to tell you at least two of them match up, at least for a triangle. And if I tell you that this side here is 20 inches, I can find these other sides, x and y I'm going to call them for now. That 20 inches corresponds to what side from the other triangle? The 8, because it's between the same two angles. It's between that angle is marked and the other one's not marked, but it's the only one unmarked. So those two correspond. The x has to correspond to the 18. So the y then would correspond to 14. The relationship between the sides of these triangles, since one is just an enlargement of the other, they're called similar triangles. All the angles are the same, and the sides are just multiplied by a constant, an enlargement factor or a reduction factor. So I know that 8 became 20. Because the 8 inch side is linked to the 20 inch side. If I want to know what x is, let's find x. Is x going to go on top or bottom in this other fraction, other ratio? Why does it have to go on bottom? Perfect. It's on the same triangle as the 20. What's going to go above the x? Careful. 18. 18 is the side from the other triangle that is related to the x. So now to find x, we just cross multiply and divide. What does that give us? x equals 45, I believe. Does that work? Because it doesn't add the constant amount, it's multiplied by a constant number. 20 times 18 is 360. Divide by 8 is 45. Technically, Lindsay, what's going on is your, the 8 was multiplied by 2.5 to make it 20. So everything else has to be multiplied by 2.5. So now to find y, we still have the 8 goes to 20. Where's y going to go? Still on bottom. It's still from the same triangle as the 20, right? So it has to match up with the 20. On top, the y matches up with what side from the other triangle? 14. So 14 goes up there. And once again, we cross multiply and divide. 20 times 14... 280 divided by 8 is 35. So y equals 35 inches. Does that look familiar? I know we've done that a long time ago. A little more difficult when they're not in the same orientation. Sorry about that. I had to move a couple sides around on this. So now here, again, we have to match things up. X matches up with what from the other triangle? Matches up with the 8. Because they're both between the angle that's got the two hashes and the unmarked angle. Okay? 
14 matches up with the 4, because they're both between the 1 hash and the unmarked angle. So that means the 35 matches up with the Y. So we have to have the one relationship where we know both sides, and that's going to be which one? Fourteen and four. We know both of the links. We have the number for both of them. So it could be fourteen over four or four over fourteen. It doesn't matter. I'm going to do fourteen over four. Let's say we want to find x. Is x going to go on top or bottom? Why does it go on top? Yeah, in the same triangle as the fourteen. So. The bottom number has to come from the other triangle. Which one's it going to be? Well, x relates to the 8, which is the corresponding side of the other triangle. So now it will be 14 times 8, which is 112, divided by 4, which is 28. X here is 28 units. To find Y, we're still going to use 14 over 4. Where's the Y going to go, top or bottom? It goes on bottom because it's from the same triangle as the 4. What goes above the Y? It's linked to the 35. So 4 times 35 is 140, divided by 14 is 10. So y equals 10. So we can find those corresponding sides by matching them up and knowing that they have to be proportional. They're magnified or reduced by the same amount. So if I have a rectangle that's 2 by 5, what's its area? 10 square units, 2 times 5. If I magnify that, I enlarge this to be 6. What would this top have to be? 15. Good. I multiply each side by 3. What's this new area going to be? Six times fifteen is ninety square units. Let's look at the ratios of lengths here. Two became six. That would reduce to a one third ratio, right? Five became fifteen, that's a one to three ratio as well. Or I could have done, you know, 6 came from 2 would be a 3 to 1 ratio. Same difference. Here are the ratios of volumes here. 10 became 90. That is a 1 to 9 ratio. Not the same as a 1 to 3 ratio, is it? Go ahead. There it is. Just like up here when we were converting volumes and areas, we had to adjust our conversion factor. Same down here when we're working with similar figures. The ratio of lengths is 1 to 3. I put volumes there, didn't I? It should be areas. Ratio of areas, not volumes. I'll give you a second to correct that since I screwed it up. But just like when we were converting units of area, we had to take that linear conversion factor and square it. The same here. 
we take our ratio of lengths and we square it. One third squared, if you recall, you can square the numerator. One squared is still one. And then square the denominator. Three squared is nine. So if the ratio of lengths is one to three, the ratio of areas will be one to nine. So let's say I have a really weird looking triangle. Not even triangle, it's a really weird looking shape. And I tell you that here, this length is 8 inches. The area of this shape is figured out to be 108 square inches. Here, that gets enlarged to 12 inches. And I want to know the area of that shape. To find that, what is the ratio of lengths? Well, 8 became 12. I'm going to reduce that, dividing both of those by 4. It's a 2 to 3 ratio of lengths, right? How do I use that to find the ratio of areas? Well, I take two, 2 to 3 and I square it. Perfect. What's 2 squared? 4. What's 3 squared? Nine. So my ratio of areas is 4 to 9. Does the 108 go with the 4 or the 9? It's from the smaller one, right? So it goes with the smaller number. So we are going to take 9 times 108 divided by 4. Nine times one hundred eight is nine hundred and seventy-two divided by four. Divided by nine times one hundred eight is nine hundred seventy-two divided by four, which gives us two hundred and forty-three. So, if we know the area before we enlarge it, we can use that to find the area after an enlargement. So if we have a box like this, 8 by 6 by 5, what's its volume? Well, 8 by 6 would be 48 square inches, times 5 is 240 inches cubed. If I double each of the links, the volume is now what? Sixteen times twelve is one hundred ninety-two square inches. Times ten is one thousand nine hundred twenty, which is cubed. My ratio of length here is 1 to 2, right? I doubled each of them. 5 over 10 would be 1 to 2. 8 to 16 is 1 to 2. 6 to 12 is 1 to 2. Ratio of volumes, however, is 240 to 1,920. Both of those, I'm sure you can see, can be divided by 240. It's 
that day. I'm being a little sarcastic there. I realize you'd probably have to divide it by 10 and then by 2, and but you'd get it down there to 1 to, one to 8. Do you see a relationship between those? This is volume, which means rather than squaring it, I'm most likely going to cube it. One cubed is one. Two cubed is eight. So once again, if I have an ugly or irregular shape, there's that. You can draw whatever shape you want to. It doesn't have to necessarily match mine. We all know how talented I am at drawing, so I am cheating. And let's say that this shape here is four feet tall. And this one is enlarged to be 10 feet tall. We are told that the volume of this one is 640 cubic feet. We want to find the volume of this one. The ratio of lengths here is... 4 to 10, right? Can that be reduced at all? Yeah, let's go ahead and reduce it. That by 2, that's a 2 to 5 ratio. What am I going to do to that to find my ratio of volume? Cube it. There we go. What is 2 cubed? 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 5 cubed? 125. Very good. So our ratio of volumes is 8 to 125. Once again, the 640 goes on top because that's the smaller one. goes with the smaller number, which is the 8. We will cross multiply and divide. 125 times 640 divided by 8 should be 10,000. This volume is 10,000 cubic feet. What do you think? You got to remember, way back then they didn't have television, so they had a lot of free time on their hands. Okay, for tomorrow, there is a new quiz due. That's Friday at eleven fifty-nine p.m. Yes, you can, yep, that'd be fine. Just, okay. If there's a class near, just walk on in. There is a new homework due for next Tuesday. Also, like I said, make sure you are going through Blackboard. And if you're missing any quiz grades in there, let me know so I can open up those quizzes for you in my math lab so you can retake them. Okay, you guys have a great weekend. We'll see you next Tuesday.